All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm here with Paul Manns and Josh Jabal and a couple of guests I'll introduce to you in a few minutes. Uh, quick uh, da daily summary on COVID-19. Um, these numbers are bouncing around a little bit, and I just ought to tell you, when you see um, 1853 positive cases, you go, my God, that's an awful lot, or 204 fatalities, uh, that's an awful lot, what's going on? Uh, in this case, the CDC changed their definition in the last few days of both a positive case and uh, somebody who dies of complications related to um, COVID or if somebody had COVID-like symptoms and, and passed away. So we're just uh, make truing this up so we keep with the uh, CDC and federal definitions so you know where we are uh, on a nationwide basis. Uh, you know me, the uh, other interesting number in terms of direction is hospitalization. Uh, you know, over the weekend, we went down, and that hasn't happened two days in a row, in, uh, you know, since the start of the uh, crisis. This time, we went up a little bit, but you'll see as we go forward, the trend line is still down. Um, Hartford, you can, um, the top line is Fairfield. You can see there we definitely um, have bent the curve on the way down, hit the apex. I think we feel fairly confident about that. We're maybe 10 days behind uh, New York City, a week behind New York City. Uh, next line there is a New Haven. They're maybe 10 days or so behind Fairfield County. That line is flattening out. Um, you see we have good capacity in those hospitals. And they're able to help out Hartford a little bit. The blue line at the bottom, Hartford is still picking up. And that uh, created um, you know, small increase overall in our hospitalizations. This chart again, hospitalizations is um, the lead metric we can tell for how we're doing, but I'm gonna give you some new metrics in a few minutes. But the three day moving averages down, that is good news. That says that we have good capacity in our hospitals and the degree to which hospitalization tells us something about the overall infection rate. That's a good trend line. But we're not out of the woods. And I just wanted to uh, put this um, chart on here to remind you that these countries were all uh, two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks in front of the United States in terms of getting hit with this uh, pandemic. We could learn a lot from their responses. And we can also learn a lot from what they didn't do right. Each and every one of them uh, thought that they had this um, crisis under control. They loosened up on their social distancing and each and every one of them now has seen an increase in COVID-related infections uh, yet again. Uh, so we're gonna monitor this very carefully. What I really would like to do, um, if I could, is give you an idea of what more we can do as we prepare for our May 20th date. You know, every week now, every Thursday, you're gonna hear from our Reopen Connecticut team. And what, what happens between now and May 20th that gives us uh, more information that allows us to make the right decisions so we can slowly, on a phase basis, reopen our state and do that very safely? And hospitalizations is, is one way to tell um, how we're doing, but it's sort of a blunt instrument. And I'll tell you a few other uh, things we're doing, including testing or over and above testing, to give us a better idea of how the state is doing, how we're bending the curve, and where we can start up. And first of all, I'd just like to tell you about um, HowWeFeel.org. How We Feel is um, created by an amazing MIT um, a neuroscience engineer and a number of people in epidemiology and infectious diseases. And uh, we're going to uh, meet, you'll be able to meet him in a, just a few minutes. But right now with how we feel, it's spread virally around the uh, uh, country in a computer science way, not an uh, epidemic way. And uh, what they've done is they're able to test different symptoms. You self-report on a voluntary basis symptoms, everything from a uh, cough, fever, and the such. You get that posted. We have thousands of people here in the state of Connecticut um, using the HowWeFeel.org app right now. And uh, I'd like to uh, say that we are the first state to officially sanction How We Feel as an official partnership. How We Feel is going to take information from all over the state if more and more of you sign up for this app. It takes just a few minutes to put in your basic symptoms. And uh, in turn, um, the leaders there, epidemiological um, at How We Feel, will report back to the Department of Public Health here in uh, 
our state and give us the best information they have in terms of what they see from these early symptoms going forward. More on that in a minute. Next, after the How We Feel um, app, we're doing a lot with thermometers. Uh, we've just uh, got our first 3,500 um, smart thermometers. They're Bluetooth enabled. You uh, uh, take the temperature of yourself and your family uh, in the morning and in the evening. That in turn connects to your phone. That goes up to the cloud. So along with how we feel, we're going to have a temperature map of what's going on in the state of Connecticut. We'll see where those symptoms maybe are moving a little bit. Maybe they're followed by fevers in a more official way. Tells us where the next potential hotspot should be or can be. I mean, right now we know that um, just through infections and hospitalizations, New York is down and uh, Fairfield County is down, Hartford is up. We know that Boston is up right now, so we worry about what's coming in from the east at this point. And we look around the rest of the country that uh, Louisiana is down, or more particularly New Orleans, but uh, Chicago is up. But it, within our state, there are respective hotspots, and how we feel and our thermometers will allow us to test that. In addition, uh, Josh has ordered tens of thousands of fever meters, a fever thermometer. And those are going to be incredibly helpful for us just to make sure that when you go into a manufacturing site, a Pratt & Whitney or Electric Boat or Sikorsky or any of the smaller um, manufacturing, anybody with a temperature of more than 100.4, not allowed in. Doing this what we can to, in, in order to better protect you. And over time, we may find that we can open up our stores and retail and big box retailers a lot faster and sooner and more safely if we have that fever meter just to test people uh, on their way in and make sure um, you're not likely to um, be contagious. We uh, had a good phone call today with uh, Vice President Pence's task force. A lot of conversation about testing as well. You can imagine you know, some frustration from the governors that there's not more of the testing uh, ingredients out there that you need. You know, the White House is saying you've got a lot of capacity there. But uh, we've got the razors, but we don't have the razor blades, if you can uh, follow my analogy. And there, um, we're working hard to make sure that we're able to do more of, in particular, the B PCR testing that tells you whether you're infected or not. And uh, uh, one good thing is the federal government is getting out of the way, and they're loosening uh, the regulations for us, allowing the states to do um, be a little more entrepreneurial when it comes up to getting the swabs and it comes up with getting the uh, reagents. And uh, they've now said, you can come up with your own swab and you can use uh, cotton, American cotton if you want to, just like you have on a Q-tip. And opposed to some of the other um, liquids they use to transport, you can now use saline solution. Test that with Yale New Haven. Test that with UConn. Make sure it meets your protocols. But they're giving us a little more flexibility to be able to take the lead there. A final thought on testing. Well, I'll tell you, I thought I finally was able to figure out um, health care when uh, the vice president was talking about. So this is going to be uh, based upon IRR. And I said, as a business guy, great, an internal rate of return. No, IRR stands for the International Reagent Resources. They're the ones that's setting the standards by which a state like Connecticut with great health care labs and resources will be able to figure out how we can accelerate testing by coming up with our own reagents and um, transportation uh, media. Abbott Labs, uh, I was down there on Friday for the first day, and they are now doing um, hundreds, ramping up to 1,000 tests a day. Um, this is going to be a big part of our testing future. Uh, I talked, uh, I thank, first of all, the head of CVS, because CVS is sponsoring this, uh, saying, it's amazing what you're doing in New Haven. I'd like you to be able to provide a lot of this drive-through testing in other communities starting in Hartford as soon as you can, since that's where the surge is. And I'll tell you, President Merlot gave, gave you a real compliment. He said, we've set up a few of these around the country, and thanks to the Connecticut Guard, thanks to the Connecticut State Police, this went very smoothly. It was up within 48, um, 72 hours. We're now doing the testing, and uh, you're going to be a priority to expand. Uh, of those tests, I was uh, a little sad to see that, um, uh, well, um, uh, Caucasians tested positive about 8 percent. Um, African Americans tested positive about uh, 30, 35 percent. 
and we're going to do a much better job as we can to make sure that we have testing available for all of our people, especially those in the most uh, diverse communities in our cities, and get them uh, prompt attention to medical care, make sure that uh, nobody is left behind there. Finally, with uh, Vice President Pence, we also said, what are you going to do with all this testing? It's going to be uh, followed by contact tracing and make sure that once we find out somebody maybe is infected or liable to be infected, uh, we can uh, make sure we figure out who else they may be met with over a period of time. The CDC is sending thousands of contact tracers out right now. You know, to me, there may be some civil liberties issues there, and it seems very manually intensive for a state like Connecticut with the 3.5 million people, not to mention New York. So we're also looking at other um, ways that we can do this, as well as uh, uh, people power. Uh, one, as you know, is that um, Apple and Google are coming out with their app. I think it's going to be within three to four weeks. So the president mentioned it some um, a month or so ago. And this will say for anybody who opts in, anybody who wants to be notified that they recently came into contact with somebody who was later found to be a COVID carrier, you'll be notified. And you'll know that you should at least self-quarantine going forward. Uh, finally, with the, in the vice president's call, we talked a lot about um, other the business side of what's going on here and how we can provide support for people going forward. As you know, the um, Paycheck Protection um, Program that was tapped out, um, you know, last week, uh, and there's a real urgency to get another 250 billion. That's the money you need to help our small businesses power through for the next couple of months. Uh, David Lehman gave us some uh, relatively good news that, uh, well, by no means did all of the companies that need it get it. We did have over 18,000 Connecticut small businesses uh, get access to that money. That's about $4.2 in aggregate. So we did um, relatively well compared to uh, some of our peer states out there. The supplemental, which is the next bill that will be coming out of the Senate, um, obviously the governors were pushing hard for um, uh, $500 billion to help pay for state and local governments in terms of lost revenue. And uh, I had an occasion to um, mention to the Vice President the two other things of importance to our state and all the other states. Um, you know, one is the unemployment compensation funds. Fortunately, we had put another $150 million into it over the last uh, year and a half. So we were relatively well-funded, but by no means well-funded, by no means not enough to deal with this, um, the level of unemployment claims that is hitting us. And so if you make that a loan to the states, which is what you traditionally do to true up that, that'll be a loan that's paid back by small business over the next uh, years. And that's no way to dig out from under a recession make that a grant. And secondly, we're talking about a long-term loan to our state pension funds in general, those that are um, you know, now underfunded in part thanks to uh, you know, the downturn in the stock market. And uh, those are two things that the Vice President is going to be looking at as potentially part of our next supplemental. But let me take you back to uh, howwefeel.org, because this is an amazing uh, app that's going to put Connecticut at the very forefront uh, in anticipation of more testing, being able to tell how people are doing, how they're feeling, and that's an early indicator of where our hotspots are. And first, I'd like to ask uh, Feng Jung to speak. He's a professor of neuroscience at MIT. He's been a leader here. We're so proud to be able to call you a partner and take the lead in making sure that how we feel is spread to, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of Connecticut residents taking the lead. Professor? Hi, um, <clears throat> Governor, thank you very much for having me be a part of your uh, press briefing. Um, uh, I'm from uh, uh, a project called How We Feel, and I, I, my day job is a professor at MIT. But uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, my colleagues and I became very concerned about the virus uh, and how quickly it is spreading through the community. Uh, we also recognized that there was a lack in testing uh, capabilities. So we thought, um, can we come up with a different way to be able to track the spread of viruses? By talking with a number of colleagues and a number of concerned um, uh, colleagues who want to volunteer uh, to put together a new solution, uh, we formed a nonprofit organization called the How We Feel Project. And through this project, we developed a mobile application called How We Feel, which is available through the Apple iOS store, the Android um, uh, app store, as well as uh, via the, the, the web. Uh, so that people can uh, download this app 
uh, whether they're healthy or they are um, affected by COVID-like symptoms, uh, they can provide information to help researchers and also policymakers better understand what is happening with the virus in their local community. Through this app and also through the web app, we ask uh, individuals to contribute uh, information, not their personal information, but only their, only their zip code, as well as the symptoms and also a few other related information about how they are being affected by the ongoing pandemic. And through this information, uh, we are generating models to be able to predict the emergence of new infection hotspots uh, to be able to get finer, granu uh, more granular detail in terms of where the virus has spread to or where it's going to become an a, a emerging hotspot so that um, more, more information and more guidance can be provided uh, to those regions to be able to better combat, uh, combat the virus. As the society um, continues to cope with this virus and as we uh, begin to grapple with the question of how do we reopen the economy, uh, we're continuously evolving our app to be able to ask questions and learn more about how the community is being affected by the pandemic, where are the most challenging problems that, uh, that we need to solve, and then providing those informations through the questions that we ask uh, to uh, policymakers and also uh, researchers in public health and epidemiology so that we can continue uh, to best serve uh, the, the general public uh, to be able to overcome uh, all of the devastations that this virus has brought us. And it's a great pleasure to be working with the state of Connecticut and the government of Connecticut. And uh, we look forward to interacting uh, on a regular basis, on a daily basis with epidemiologists from the Department of Health to continuously monitor and also provide useful information uh, to, the, uh, to the people of the state of Connecticut. Um, we have been collaborating with a large number of uh, individuals, uh, both experts in epidemiology from Harvard, from Yale, from UPenn, uh, Cornell, University of Maryland, Stanford University, to be able to continuously analyze the data, glean, uh, generate new insights about what is happening, and then provide the information back. And then we are also uh, joined by other volunteers who are uh, instrumental in developing the app, many uh, software designers and uh, app developers from uh, Pinterest and also other companies, and also Ben Silverman, who is the founder of Pinterest, uh, together, uh, both funding and also uh, supporting this nonprofit in initiative. One last point about our app is that, um, as we read in the news, that there is an enormous food shortage that has been brought on by this pandemic. Uh, every user um, that downloads the app is matched with a, a free meal donation of Feeding America. And this is a nonprofit organization that supports the food banks around the country. Uh, so we're hoping that we can provide uh, up to 10 million free meals uh, to people who are affected uh, by this pandemic. We're really excited to continue to work with the state governments and also uh, with the public health officials uh, to provide useful information. And as you use the app, uh, if you have any suggestions, please feel free to provide feedback through our website. And uh, we're, we're here to fight with you uh, to help uh, us overcome uh, this enormous devastation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jung. You are amazing, and uh, we're proud of this partnership. And as he mentioned, let me mention three more times, this is all anonymous. It's broken down by zip code, not by individual. And uh, how we feel is being coordinated closely with our Department of uh, Public Health under Commissioner Renee Coleman-Mitchell. But here in particular is uh, Dr. Lynn Sosa. And Lynn has been working collaboratively with uh, how we feel. And how is this going to work for Connecticut, Lynn? Hi. Thanks, Governor. So we're really excited about this app. Um, and the reason for that is because the, we know that the data that we get about testing is really just the tip of the iceberg. And so we want to have um, data about how many people are sick as well as how many people are not sick at a given point in time. And that's why we're really excited about this app and the data that it can provide to us. It's gonna give us another piece of information about how many people are sick at a given point in time and allow us to follow that uh, through the course of this pandemic. So both these resources are here to answer any questions that you may have. Um, and with that, Max, any questions? We'll start with the Hartford Current. Hey, Governor. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, the protest that's going to be starting in about a half an hour. Um, some of the, the rally organizers have said that they feel that the executive orders have overstepped a bit. Can you respond to that? 
I could respond by saying um, you've seen evidence that our uh, executive orders and the social distancing, thanks to the amazing people of the state of Connecticut, are working, that we are beginning to bend the curve, at least in the southern part of the state. And this is no time to take our eye off the ball. I loved it when Dr. Koh, who's uh, co-leading our um, you know, reopen Connecticut effort was asked that question. He said, I'd like each of those demonstrators to walk through uh, one of my ICU units and see what, um, what pain and hurt and, and fatalities can result from this uh, pandemic. So it's really important we do this on a safe basis and how we feel is one of the ways we're gonna be able to do it even more effectively. There was also another press briefing this morning about the workers' compensation presumption. Do you have any plans of writing that into an executive order? Uh, we're definitely going to take a look at that and um, see what that involves. Look, our essential workers are vital, and they're, they are going in uh, at some risk to themselves. And how we can work that into workmen's compensation is something we have to, I will figure out. Uh, but I can tell you, as you know, there's absolutely no cost for the testing for anybody, including them. There's no cost for treatment. Uh, you get at least uh, your 14 days sick leave paid, and we're going to do better than that. We'll move on Thank to you. move on to Channel Three Eyewitness News. Channel Three Eyewitness News. Governor, yes, hi, sorry for the technical difficulty. I had a quick question about unemployment and claims that are labeled as processed. Does that mean the claim has been approved, still in the process? What, what does that exactly mean? I believe process means they've been approved, and if the uh, money has not yet been deposited, it's about to. Do you know more than that, That's Paul? correct, sir. That's about right. Thank you. Move on to the day. Hi, Governor. Uh, Julia Bergman with the day. Um, as your office and also the um, advisory committee debates uh, reopening the state, is there thought given to reopening um, different portions of the state at different times? For example, might there be a different process for Eastern Connecticut versus Fairfield County, which is obviously closer to New York City? Well, that's why I have this committee to help uh, advise me on, on this, and um, I'm going to reserve judgment. Uh, as you know, my instinct is if um, uh, if I open Willie Brew and Willow Manic, but there's no bars open in uh, Stanford, you're going to have a lot of people traveling back and forth, and uh, and the virus could travel. That's probably not a good thing. That's why I've tended to work, you know, on a regional basis, not just within the state of Connecticut, but perhaps some things can open on a local basis. So. Let's give our folks a couple of weeks. We'll hear back from them. And one other question. You mentioned at the um, start that the CDC had changed the definition for positive cases and um, complications that resulted in death. Can you explain what those changes were? Want to speak to that? Yeah, actually, we, Lynn's the expert on this. Lynn, do you want to take that one? Yeah, Lynn, thank you. Sure. Hi. So, um, so the goal of a case definition is to make sure that when Connecticut says that we have a case of COVID-19, that we're speaking the same language as somebody in New York or someone in California. And so that's actually a joint effort between the state epidemiologists and CDC. And so that was something that came out um, actually probably about 10 days ago. And so we've uh, made changes to make sure that we are reporting our data that is consistent and classifying cases according to that definition. And then we realized today that in the, our, our daily reporting that we had not uh, pulled all of that information into our daily report. So as soon as we realized that, we uh, made that update today. So this just um, affected data that we reported since Thursday. We'll move on Helpful to times. News 8. News 8. Connecticut Mirror. Uh, professor, could you give us a sense of how broad a database would you need to have on this app for it to be useful? And do you have any idea as to how long it might take to uh, build that database? So again, that you do have a useful database. 
Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so we launched the app about two weeks ago, and uh, as of today, we have about 300,000 users um, around the country. And in the state of Connecticut, there are about 3,500 uh, 3, plus uh, users. And so we're hoping that um, we'll get more Connecticut users. From the data that we have been able to collect so far, we're already able to get uh, useful information. Uh, so for instance, uh, we uh, find through our data uh, that uh, the loss of uh, smell and loss of taste seem to be most strongly correlated with uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, patients. We're also finding that testing is um, lag behind uh, and also uh, being able to receive testing result from when you first get tested, uh, it can take up to seven days for that result, result to arrive uh, to, the, to the person. And so these are just some of the information that we're starting to find. Uh, in order to get uh, more detailed location information, we need to have more users and we're working on that. And, uh, and hopefully in the next uh, week or, or so, uh, we'll have uh, enough users so that we can provide um, useful location information for the state, state of Connecticut. In a state the size of Connecticut, can you give us a sense of how many users that would be? To be um, useful? So for the state of Connecticut, um, uh, I think what we can uh, find is that uh, there are going to be many different geographical areas. For example, the uh, New Haven or Hartford, uh, there are going to be different regions. And so what is critical is to get enough people within each one of the regions. And we, we may not get enough people for all the regions all at once, but starting uh, in, in more concentrated areas, uh, we hope that we can get uh, sufficient data. For a place like Hartford or Connecticut, if we can get uh, 50,000 users, uh, or, or maybe even lower, 10,000 users, uh, that should already be enough for us to, to get um, quite a bit of information. And, and Governor, just one quick follow-up on the workers' comp question. You said you're going to be looking at it, but uh, Labor has indicated they have asked the administration a, a while ago to look at it. So uh, are you saying that this has not been examined at all yet? No, I think um, our, our team has examined it. I haven't gotten any recommendations from them as yet, Paz. Okay, thank you. Move on to NBC Connecticut. What is the cost of this collaboration with HowWeFeel.org? Is there any cost to the state? No cost to the state that I know of. No, nope. zero. Zero. Okay. That's great. And my second question is actually a follow-up to something I asked last Friday regarding the state's decision to continue to collect a bottle deposit. Uh, Paul, you had said that the state would continue collecting that deposit because you never ordered redemption centers to close. You just gave them guidelines for staying open. However, I did a survey of both the redemption centers listed on the state's website, big box stores, major grocery chains across the state, and none of them seemed to be open. And when I asked why, they said it's because the state ordered them closed. So while they may be misinformed, they do all seem to be closed. So would you re uh, consider revisiting that decision to keep collecting the bottle deposit? Be happy to uh, get back to you if we have further discussions with the Department of Energy and Envi Environmental Protection. Thank you. Good catch. Move on to Fox 61. Zinnia Maldonado, Fox 61. Uh, Governor, will there, will there be any type of enforcement for wearing face masks? We know you can't easily enforce something like this, but for example, if a resident needs to take mass transit to get to work, but doesn't have a face mask on, the bus driver wants to be safe, but they can't deny a person entry on the bus, what should be done in a situation like this? I, I think a lot of enforcement can be done at the local level. You know, my philosophy on that is uh, at this point in time, um, we'll go up and we'll tell you this is what the rules are and I want you to follow the rules. There won't be a fine or a penalty at this point and we'll see uh, what transpires from there. But so far in all of our different, um, you know, executive orders, uh, safe stores, safe manufacturing, um, the enforcement hasn't been a big issue because everybody's tended to follow the lead in a serious way for which I'm most appreciative. And then you mentioned new thermometers that will check temperatures especially important for essential workers at manufacturing jobs. But what about those who don't show symptoms but are positive and are still coming into work? Is there any way you guys are working on how we might be able to pinpoint those residents? Uh, well, obviously, testing is the best way to do that. The antibody testing would say if you had seen if you had built up some sort of an immunity. Otherwise, the PCR testing 
But that, that's a big deal to ramp that up to such a degree. You'd have to test that on every week or so because people can get infected. So in the meantime, the fever test is a way that we can see at least a very early symptom, you know, obviously followed by the How We Feel app, which gives us a broad base of what we're trying to do, and masks. It's going to be really important that all those folks, if they can't maintain that six-foot distance, have to wear a mask in a manufacturing facility. Move along next to WTIC 1080 News. Good afternoon, Governor. Good Something afternoon. different today. Oil prices plummeted to negative $38 per barrel. Are you hearing anything about the pressure being put on gas stations and small business in Connecticut due to something that's unprecedented and unheard of? Well, it's a shocking number considering where we were just uh, a year ago, not to mention 10 years ago. Uh, I want to make sure that that drop in oil prices is reflected at the gas pump, first of all. I think that's, uh, you know, incredibly important. I know what it means in terms of our transportation fund, because we rely upon the gas tax to uh, rebuild our roads and bridges, and uh, that's taken a real hit. So I suppose I think about the plunge in gas uh, prices in a different way than many people do. It's also going to have amazing international uh, security issues. You know, Russia is going to lose their base of funding uh, pretty fast. And what's that going to mean in terms of transforming that country? We'll see. And if I can, earlier on the, the teleconference with the White House, a few of the governors asked Vice President Pence to ask the president to, uh, I guess, um, ask protesters not to come out like they are going to shortly in Hartford. Do you, did you join in that call at all? I, I definitely joined in the call. I, I don't remember that particular question, but I, I'd echo the, um, what my fellow governors on both sides of the aisle said. I mean, the president was pretty clear a couple of days ago, I'm going to leave it up to the governors. I'm going to give you the best guidance I can, but you're the place where the rubber meets the road. So we don't need him going out and, um, you know, inciting people to, you know, create some disturbances. We're going to work through this in a very collaborative way, and I look forward to, um, making sure the protesters keep a good, safe social distance and make sure they don't get infected. Thank you. We'll move on to the Waterbury Republican American. Thanks, sorry about that. Um, I wanted to get a little better handle on the, the level of testing and how soon that testing would be available for Connecticut to be able to get back to the new normal, I guess. Um, you know, how many, I thought I saw a statistic about 85 tests per million right now. Uh, what, what, what would it have to be? What, what, yeah, what are the testing needs here? I'll start off and then maybe Josh would um, pick up on it. Um, We've ramped up our testing big time. As you remember, originally you had to send everything down to Atlanta, then they let us do it within our own public lab. Now we have testing going on at uh, 20 different hospitals, and uh, not to mention uh, Jackson Labs and uh, a number of other private. Uh, Jackson has told us they could get up to 10,000 tests a day. You know, Abbott Lab is going to get up to 1,000 tests a day. So we're going to be able to ramp up in a significant way, and that's just the PCR testing, the testing that determines whether or not um, you've been infected or not. Josh? Yeah, that's right. And one of, one of the main uh, work streams that the Reopen CT Advisory Board is, is studying is this testing ramp up strategy, um, both what we want to aim for in terms of testing volumes and then also how we operationalize that, looking at all the different testing technologies, the different sites and delivery methodologies. Uh, one of the really great things about having Dr. Koh on this task force is that Yale has a tremendous research organization where they're looking at all these emerging technologies and helping us get good headlights into what could become part of our, our uh, testing portfolio so we can get out in front of that. So we'll have more to share on that in the, in the coming weeks. Yeah, but when, when will this fever testing start? When will you, you know, because obviously with this, with this protest today, there, there are people who want to get back to work, and that's a legitimate uh, concern. So. When will you guys be in a position to be able to say, yes, we can be, we'll be able to do fever testing, we'll be able to do antibody testing, we'll be do, you know, and, and just not just, and not just first responders or people who have a note from the doctor. 
Remember, the Abbott Lab test right now, uh, all you do is fill out CVS.com, put in your symptoms, and you line up for a test. I got to say, they're very popular and they're filled up. Uh, you're going to see a dramatic increase in testing such that we'll be able to make the determination uh, before May 20th about what is the best staging for getting this state open again. That's a key uh, date for me. We'll, okay, thank you. We'll move on next to the Associated Press. Good after, afternoon, Governor. It's Sue Haig. Um, regarding the contact tracing, how do you see that fitting in Connecticut's plan to reopen, and how much of it is happening now? And do you plan on having it more of a technology-based endeavor, or you, you just you sort of mentioned earlier that you had a little concern about people going out to um, residents' homes. So how do you foresee it happening? Well, Sue, um We've got probably 50 experts on the reopened Connecticut, including those that specialize in testing, specialize in um, a lot of the databases that we're looking at right now. I know Charlie Baker in Massachusetts. I know the CDC down in Washington, D.C. They're thinking about this in terms of a manual operation. Charlie's got probably 1,000 monitors already hired who are there finding out who's been infected and seeing who else they worked with. As I said before, that seems fairly labor intensive. I'm not sure you could scale it up fast enough. So I'm also curious about the um, technology platforms out there, like the uh, Google Apple one, comma, with due deference to um, you know, absolute privacy, because that's sort of a hallmark of our country. And you mentioned that the federal government is, um, getting, in, is getting out of the way of states being entrepreneurial when it comes to finding alternatives for the swabs and the reagents. Can you talk a little bit about more specifically what Connecticut, the state plans to do to try to you know, make those supplies available? Yeah, working with um, our labs, see what we can do now that we have the cotton um, ingredient allowed to use that for the swabs. You know, before it was a special material, half of it came from Italy. Italy was in the middle of a pandemic. There was an enormous shortage. So that opens up a lot of possibilities for us. I um, will be working with the entrepreneurs at some of our um, you know, life sciences companies to see what they can develop there. What are the best uh, media to transport the uh, swabs? I mentioned the saline solution. That would be transformative. Anything that lets us get control of this process ourselves, so I don't have to wait for China, I don't have to wait for Italy, I don't have to wait for the stockpile in Washington, is a big plus. So I appreciate the federal government getting out of the way and giving us some of these options. Also, there's a couple of amazing Connecticut companies that are working on the saliva test. And that would, you'd be able to self-test on almost a daily basis. And if we find out that we're able to do this in an FDA-approved way, accelerate that process. You want to get a big testing, um, as Paul was alluding to, imagine if you could do a self-test, a saliva test on a regular basis at your own home and get, get that transported and analyzed in real time. Thank you. We'll move along to Connecticut Public Media. Thank you. I have uh, two data related questions. And uh, the first is for um, probably Josh on death numbers. And it's uh, does the state have any specific number on how many healthcare workers in Connecticut have died from COVID-19 related complications? Uh, and if so, is there any breakout between workers at hospitals and workers at nursing homes? We don't we don't have that data. The data split out that way now. Okay. Uh, and the next question is a general question for the governor on data collection. Um, governor, if howwefeel.org is aggregated to zip codes, are, are you talking about possibly taking targeted public health actions in certain zip code future? And if so, could you maybe just talk a bit about how that might? Yeah, I, I might ask uh, Dr. Jung to help me with that answer, but uh, zip codes is an anonymized way that we can be able to see where there might be potential flare-ups. Look, this is not going to go away on May 20th, and it's not going to go away on July 1, and we've got to be able to track this in sort of a real-time basis. So, Doctor, maybe explain a little more how the zip code gives us actionable intelligence. Sure. Um, so through the data that we collect, um, it may be possible that we can identify certain zip codes to have uh, more people who are infected. Um, and, and that information may allow us to distribute more uh, personal protective equipments, for example, making more masks available 
or um, providing more information and, and more advisory for social distancing. Um, and those are the things that uh, may be um, possible uh, if we have more nuanced information about uh, if one specific area uh, is, is more severely affected. But we would, we would, would we be seeing closures coming back in certain areas that had already reopened? I'm just trying to get some clarity on that. Uh, that's to be determined. Uh, you know, uh, I've said uh, before, I'm terrified of the fact that like some of those other countries I referenced, you could have a second surge, maybe not as severe, but a second surge. And some of those other countries are beginning to close down some of their, um, you know, uh, socializing places, any bars and restaurants and the such. So I want to be very careful that we don't have to go back. I just think that would be a body blow to our um, to our economy. I want to make sure we open, we stay open, and we go forward from there. Thanks. We'll move on to Hearst, Connecticut Media. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I'm kind of interested uh, for you to go into a little bit more about the peak, um, Governor. Um, you, it's, it's going down in Fairfield County then, and when do you anticipate it having peaked in New Haven? Again, as, as you could see, um, based upon just a very short sample, three-day sample, it is leveling off anyway in, in New Haven, and that's amazing good news. That's not New Haven City, that's New Haven County. And uh, that shows in a place that we have a fairly dense population, you know, got Waterbury, New Haven, you know, they are beginning to make a difference. They're following the social distancing. Obviously, it's ramping up in Hartford. I worry a little bit about Eastern Connecticut just because of Boston and the fact that that's on fire right now. Um, and, and Governor, I don't know when you found out the, uh, you were talking about the 35% African Americans. Um, what, can, what can you do in the shorter term at this point? Well, the first thing we wanted to do is um, make sure we get the testing in an urban environment like New Haven, where we have the broadest uh, options for people to get um, tested, and B, provide transport for people who can't get transport there. So we can find people who are infected earlier and, um, and, and be able to provide treatment for them on an earlier basis. I think that's number one. And as uh, Paul mentioned a few days ago, I think, this is just one of the long-term reminders of what we learn out of this uh, damn pandemic, uh, which is the health disparities in our country. And uh, we got to do a better job of making sure that um, asthma and diabetes and a lot of those um, uh, morbidities, comorbidities that can impact you, not just with COVID, but otherwise we treat on a more comprehensive way. Uh, I'm really proud of the fact we were able to expand coverage of health care in a dramatic way over the last uh, you know, couple of months to make sure everybody knows they're going to be able to get, get the testing, get the treatment they need at no cost, and we have many more people insured than we did before. So th those are important criteria going forward. And I will, I'll just add this, I'll add this, Ken. Remember, this is our first site, one of our first sites in Connecticut in which you don't have to go to a primary care physician to get uh, appointment for a test and so that's going to give us the ability to expand upon uh, the opportunity that the CVS Minute Clinic uh, site in New Haven has created for the state so we're going to be looking for additional expansion opportunities uh, with various other partners uh, to expand testing in our urban communities thank you move on to Boseto Media Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Today, Governor Cuomo said that he will use the situation to improve many services in New York. Governor Lamont, how will you use the situation to reimagine improve and build back better in Connecticut. And my second question is, as protests are racing through different states in the United States, including Connecticut, can you talk about your plans for the multi-state council members that will be working with the regional council to reopen the economy? Uh, yeah, the second question first. Um, 
you know, uh, Indra and Alfred Coe um, will be representing Connecticut along with Paul Mounds. Uh, they're already having informal conversations. You know, really right now about testing, about antibodies, about PCR, what we can learn from each other going forward. And that will result, I think, in some of our first formal meetings in terms of what we're learning in terms of best practices and thinking about in terms of schedule. Uh, your, your other question um, is really important. And, uh, and, and, and Governor Cuomo is right. I mean, out of this crisis, what have we learned? What can we reimagine? How can we be better? Um, you know, we just mentioned the health disparities and how what that means in terms of communities, what that means in terms of pandemic, not just for the uh, community, say the African-American community, but for our broader community. And we're going to learn from that and expand on that. It reminds us of the incredible importance of, uh, you know, universal health care so that everybody has a level of coverage so that they don't feel like they have to stay home if they're very sick, because we know what that can mean. Uh, I can tell you I'm thinking a lot right now about um, the state of Connecticut and how we're positioned on the backside of this pandemic. I can tell you that um, there were an awful lot of businesses and, uh, and homeowners who are thinking about Connecticut in a whole new light. You know, if in the last 15 years, oh man, I want to be in the big city, that's where the action is. If, you're not, if your office isn't in the big city, you can't get the millennials. And, and that disadvantaged Connecticut over the last uh, 15 or so years. I think now you're seeing some real advantages um, with the idea that social distancing may come up again, the idea that uh, you can work from home and telecommute. You don't have to be in, say, the Big Apple or Boston uh, five days a week. I think people are going to take a whole new look at a state like Connecticut, and uh, we're going to figure out how we position ourselves going forward. Those are two very different answers to your question. Thank you, Governor. We'll move on to CT News Junkie. Hi, Governor. I wanted to know, you cite hospitalizations as something that you are watching when it comes to reopening the state. So how many days in a row will they have to drop if Connecticut's going to reopen by May 20th? Uh, I think that um, you know, the Pence Council in Washington said, um, you know, 28 days, 14 days for Cheer 1, which is uh, sort of almost where we're going to be pretty soon and then 14 days for Tier 2, and Tier 2 gives you permission to think about um, schools, opening up retail with all the necessary practical precautions. So, Christine, that's why I think May 20th is a date where we really can make some um, much more informed um, uh, decisions. And as we tried to talk about in this press conference today, um, hospitalizations is now just one metric. We're gonna have a much better sense of infections, immunizations, fevers, precursors to what may be happening out there, so we'll be much better informed over the next few weeks. You and know, Governor, I, the Connecticut Legal Rights Project is asking you to release people, if possible, from state-operated psychiatric facilities. Is that something that you are considering? It's something i got to look into, Christine. Um, it's a, release to what? you got to make sure that there's a safe place where somebody um, in, uh, in that state can be protected and has the necessary uh, support and counseling uh, they may need. Uh, that said, absolutely, just like we're doing in other um, compressed environments where the pandemic can spread. I'll just leave you one thought. Um, Susan Beitzwitz and I uh, were at Rentschler Field uh, this morning, uh, bright and early, because um, Food Share was uh, distributing food. Uh, on a drive-up basis, and there were hundreds of cars, cars that got there two hours earlier than um, it opened at, at 8.30 in the morning. Um, and these were good folks who had a good job, and things were doing pretty good for them up until about a month ago. And there were a lot of people that were scared there. And uh, But thanks to Food Share, Thanks to uh, 4CT, which uh, raised a fair amount of money to help buy food. Thanks to some amazing volunteers. Um, cars were in that line for an hour and a half. They didn't want to be there. They weren't taking advantage of a situation. But it was a state, and thanks to volunteers and thanks to Food Share, we were able to take care of people. It is that type of spirit that's going to help us all get through this. And we're making progress every day. I do believe that. Thanks, everybody.